Welcome to the Soul Seeker Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Kabert, and this year marks the fifth birthday of the Soul Seeker Podcast. I started this pod back in 2019 when I was taking my first steps on the path of remembering. And at the time, the tagline for the show was a journey of self discovery. A year later, it became a journey of remembering. Yet, what I know now is back then I was still seeking. And what I've come to know now is that it's the journey of seeking that brings us the silent, slow stillness of acceptance. And therein lies our own innate wisdom. It's my mission now to eradicate the glorification of hustle culture, as it was my drive in entrepreneurship that led to a greater whole. And that's because I was outsourcing my sovereignty rather than looking within. So let this be your invitation to take a deep breath in and remember that at any time we can shift our thoughts and our feelings to create the outer world in which we wish to live. Soul Seekers, it's time to grow. I am so excited for this podcast. Dr. Jill Bolte-Taylor, I have been a fan of this woman since I first came across her and this amazing concept and science-backed evidence of the 90-second rule. And I will let Dr. Jill speak about that herself. But before we get started, just to ground a bit, if you are driving or if you're doing anything that's keeping you from being present and you can't close your eyes, then just breathe with us. Otherwise, I invite you to take a seat just for a minute or two as we ground together. And Dr. Jill, for you and I, let's go ahead, close our eyes. Listeners, if it feels safe to do so, I invite you to close your eyes, feel your feet on the floor, just allowing ourselves to slow down and taking this time to connect with our breath Finding a big inhale through the nose and inhaling all the way up. Sipping in a bit more air at the top. Through the mouth, exhale. A slow inhale, drawing from the feet all the way up to the third eye. And inhaling a bit more at the top. Slowly exhaling through the mouth. And one more for good measure. And sipping in a bit more air at the top. And slowly exhaling. And our own time flickering the eyes back open. And just like Dr. Jill's acronym BRAIN, very similar to my acronym BREATH, that B stands for BREATHE. Dr. Jill, Thank you so much for making the time and welcome to the Soul Seeker podcast. Sam, I'm so happy to be with you and yours. Thank you for inviting me. It's an honor. It's all mine. So let's dive straight into it. Now, I do have a pre-intro where I'm giving a little bit of your background. So let's just talk about the 90 second rule. Can you tell us in your own words what the 90 second rule is? So when you stop and you think about what's going on inside of the brain, only three things are ever going on. We think thoughts, we feel emotions, and then we run a physiological response to what we're thinking and what we're feeling. And so from the moment I think a thought that may trigger a emotional circuit, and then the emotional circuit goes to the a uh, limbic system and says, uh, dump something into the bloodstream, like if it's uh, anger or if it's fear, these will be different chemicals, that something gets dumped into the bloodstream, it flushes through my bloodstream and out of my bloodstream in less than 90 seconds. So we have, we are constantly running this loop of, of response reactivity from the moment we're thinking thoughts, feeling emotions, running the physiological loop, flushes through our blood, flushes out of us less than 90 seconds. And, and you know, that's typical, but certainly then people are saying, oh, I can stay angry for a whole lot longer than 90 seconds. But what you're actually doing is rethinking the thoughts. I mean, just think about it. The next time you're you're angry, if you keep reiterating to yourself what it is I'm mad about, I'm mad about it, I'm mad about it. And then the telephone rings, ping, hello. 
and you get distracted away and we're literally saved by the bell because now we've broken that cycle of what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling, my physiological response, but we do our work in the moment we hang up that telephone and we go back to recognizing I can re-engage in that circuitry and start running that anger or that fear or whatever that loop is again, or I can literally feel that I was saved by the bell and I can move on to something else because I've already shifted out of the circuitry. Thank you. So the question I have for you is when we go back to thinking about that thing and then we get caught in that emotion, does it start a new 90 second cycle? It depends. It depends. Sometimes by, let's say, Let's say, um, let's say you call me up and you say, honey, uh, I know I was going to take you out to dinner tonight, but uh, this came up and I really want to go do this. And it's like, Arr. and so my initial response may be a reactive guttural, Arr. you know, so now I'm thinking he doesn't care. I, he doesn't value me. I'm feeling uh, angry or fearful or scared because maybe, maybe you were going to do something with me and we were going to do something where you were going to help me. But now I'm, I'm feeling vulnerable and, uh, and I'm running that loop and I'm angry and I may be yelling. I may be sulking. I may be calling my mother, uh, who knows what I'm doing, but I go through that and then I break through that cycle. And then let's say a phone call comes in and I deal with some business. And so all the affect, the, the limbic emotional feeling tissue is calmed down because I'm not dealing with emotions now. And then I hang that up and then it's in that moment, I can think about you and I can think, you know, it really is good that he's going to go play some basketball because mm, it, it, he'll be so much better when he comes back, you know? And so now I've broken the circuit. It's, it, it is, it is the fine art of, of being aware of what is my own circuitry that I'm running what are my choices that I can be running? And what do I want to be running? I mean, these are decisions that we're making on an ongoing basis. And uh, paying attention when we are willing to pay attention to the circuitry that we're running and we realize then that we have multiple choices. What are my choices as a, as a human uh, to any circumstance? And who do I want to be? Do I have the power to choose moment by moment who and how I want to be in the world? And the fact of the matter is, yeah, pretty much once we know what our choices are, then we can choose. Amazing. I'm, I'm a big fan of that, you know, having the, the ability to choose and the awareness, the awareness, that's the word I'm looking for. And I find when I'm working with the 90 second rule. I've told this story so many times, but I'll go to pistachios and I have a big bag. And then minutes later, half a bag later, I'll think to myself, what am I doing? And then the next thought is, what am I avoiding from feeling? And it's in that moment, I'm able to go from reacting, which is emotional and binge eating for me to responding. And that's when I invoke the breath process, which is very similar to your brain uh, acronym. And I I still have so many more questions about the 90 second rule, but I feel like this is a good time to bring in the brain huddle. So could you speak to us a little bit about the brain huddle? Yeah. Yes. I noticed when I was looking uh, over your work, your breathe and my breath um, uh, to me, mine's actually brain, um, but the B stands for breath. So so as we look at our brain, so I'm a neuroanatomist. So I studied the anatomy of the brain. And I look at the brain as uh, the, the uh, brain stem and spinal cord and brain stem region, the reptilian brain. And these are, we all have this, and this, these are on off switches. I'm hungry, I eat, I'm done. I want to mate, I mate, I'm done. You know, just these on off, off uh, needs. Um, and then new tissue gets added on and then we create a mammal. So the difference between a reptile and a mammal is the addition of this new tissue, which uh, is uh, the limbic system, the emotional tissue. But emotional isn't just emotional. Emotional is experiential. 
So we end up with this new tissue. We have a uh, fight or flight uh, syndrome in each of our two hemispheres. Everything is bilateral. So we have two amygdala and the amygdala are asking the question moment by moment, am I safe? Am I physically safe? Because as a biological creature, I'm alive and the threat to being alive is to not be alive. And that can happen in an instant, boom, they're, I'm gone. So the amygdala bring in the information from the external world and they assess everything and they say, what feels familiar? And if enough of it, the of my experience feels familiar, then my amygdala can be calm and I can relax. And in that relaxation, I can turn on the hippocampi, also in the limbic system. And the hippocampi then are for learning and memory. So when I feel calm and I feel safe, I can learn and memorize new patterns of behavior. Uh, but when I'm in alarm alert, forget learning anything new. I just need to rescue myself in the right here, right now experience. And I feel anxiety or I feel whatever I feel. So um, uh, so we end up with, with these two emotional systems, one in the right hemisphere, one in the left hemisphere. And then the typical difference between a typical mammal and a human is the addition of new tissue on top of that, which is higher cognitive thinking. So we end up with higher cognitive thinking tissue in the right hemisphere and in the left hemisphere. And the thinking tissue now is designed to be able to regulate and modulate the tissue below it, which is the emotional limbic tissue. So we humans, we end up with these two emotional modules of cells, one in each hemisphere, and then these corresponding two modules of thinking tissue. And so we end up with these four modules of cells and predictably your brain is organized like my brain. So that the left hemisphere has two major differences than the right hemisphere. The right hemisphere, it's right here, right now. It's this collage of all the modalities coming in. I'm in the present moment. I'm having an experience where I don't have physical boundaries. I feel like I'm as big as the universe and I'm a part of the collective whole of humanity. Well, that's a completely different part of my brain and consciousness in the left hemisphere that has a little group of cells in there that says, I am Jill Bolte Taylor. I have an identity. I have an ego. And everything in my life revolves around me. So I'm the center of my own universe. So I care about um, my job, uh, my family, uh, my bank account, my, 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 whatever, my me. And the other thing about the left hemisphere is it has linearity across time. So I have a past, I have a present, and I have a future, and I can recall past or project into the future because of that left hemisphere. So I end up with these four different modules of cells that are very different from one another. And in the brain huddle, which is, is my form of breath, in the brain huddle, this is a tool that once you know the characteristics and personalities of each of those four portions of your brain, the two emotional and the two thinking modules of cells, when you know the personalities of those, then the brain huddle becomes a tool that we can use to have ongoing conversation and negotiation between these different parts of our brain so that we're always making conscious decisions based on information that I know to be true about who and what I am as a living human based on my ability to differentiate what's going on inside of my own brain. So it's a beautiful tool so that we can have an experience whole brain living at a very conscious, aware, and joyful capacity. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of that. And I, it, it's escaping me right now the exact uh, words for the acronym. And I know it's breathe, recognize, I'm lost on the A. Yeah. So the so, brain. So breathe, yeah. So the tool is the brain huddle, B-R-A-I-N. B stands for breath. Why the breath? It's in the present moment. You, you don't breathe in the past and you don't breathe in the future. You breathe right here. So as soon as you think about your own breath, your mind is now in the present moment. 
So that's the B. R is recognize which of the four characters were you embodying and exhibiting into the world who called this brain huddle? And I encourage people to exercise all four parts of their characters of calling the huddle so that when you really need the huddle, which is when you're unhappy and you're mad and you're angry and you're sad and all of that, uh, that that part is willing to call a huddle. So R is recognize which character caused the huddle. A is appreciate, no matter who called the huddle, there's four of us. There's always four of us. I am never alone because my left thinking tissue is never without my right emotional or my right thinking or my left emotional tissue. I, I'm always four. There's always four of me, my team, my huddle, my group, in order for me to live my life. So B, breath, bring your mind to the present moment. R, recognize which part of my brain, which character called the huddle. A, appreciate regardless of who called it, there's four of us in here. I is inquire. In this moment, who do I want to be now? Which part of my brain do I want to appear as in this moment? And then N stands for navigate. Navigate moment by moment by moment because change is is what is constant. And I, if I make a decision and I say, okay, in this moment, I'm going to be my left thinking rational part of who I am. I'm going to be structured and organized, but you know, my dogs are over there um, uh, vomiting. Um, the mother in me might actually want to go over there and nurture my dogs who are having a problem, but another part of me is going to say, okay, well, just act like that's not going on and just stay right here and act like a left rational thinking person. So there's always this, this navigation of what is appropriate, what is truly appropriate in any moment, and who do I want to be in any moment? And that's the power of what we are as human beings that we can always choose that's the that that, yeah there's a quote that i've heard you say quite a bit that we are feeling creatures who think and we're not thinking creatures who feel and i think that's so powerful yeah well as you think about that reptilian brain and and because we have that tissue inside of us we have the brain stem and we have the midbrain region and then we have the addition of new tissue, which is our emotional limbic experiential tissue. Well, all the information streaming in through our cranial nerves are going into the brainstem and then into that limbic tissue. Uh, and then it gets processed at the level of the thalamus, which acts as an operator and sends it up into higher cortical thinking. So we are feeling creatures who think any information coming in will bypass through my limbic tissue before it ever gets into my higher cognition. So Jill, those are a lot of big words that I'm familiar with, but I don't personally really understand. And I think a lot of the listeners would probably agree. So I know you do a lot of work with schools. How do you explain this to children so that adults can understand it too, that aren't familiar with the brain as much as someone as yourself, you know, you know, there are third, there are three-year-olds who will come and say, mommy, my amygdala is not happy. That's amazing. It is amazing. There has been so much actual education, neurological education going on for kids over the last 10 to 15 years that uh, in my era, well, there wasn't neuro, right? In my era, there was uh, biology and psychology, um, but neuro has become its own field. And so neuro, neuro is actually being uh, taught quite a bit uh, for the little people about their own reactivity. So many children are being taught about their amygdala. Uh, the amygdala is a group of cells inside of the, the limbic system, the limbic tissue. Uh, the information comes in from the external world and it goes to those two structures, one in each hemisphere, and they process the information, am I safe? And then there's another group of cells right behind it that is the hippocampi. And that's for memory and learning. So there's this antagonistic relationship 
where if the the alarm, alarm, alert, alert is on, then I'm not going to have my hippocampi turned on and I cannot access my higher cognition. So this is all, this is actually quite common language now in young schools because we know that for different ways of learning, if you have children who don't feel safe, uh, if they come from environments where there's trauma at home in one form or another, and kids come to school and they don't feel safe, they're not going to learn new information and they're going to score very poorly, poorly uh, on tests and things. So uh, it's it's actually an exciting time in the world where neuro becomes an assumed, um, and then and then when I teach it to school communities. In the limbic system, all I really care about is understanding that amygdala and the hippocampus, which they've been taught now. And what I care about is how do we then then bring in, how do we calm and help those cells feel safe and calm so that the anxiety level goes down, fear, anger, rage, these emotions go, go low so that higher cognitive thinking uh, can actually come online and we can learn. And when we realize that we have two very think different thinking modules of cells who think differently, and we have two emotional groups of cells that feel and emote different, based on different values, shall I say, then we really can get to know pretty easily these four modules of cells and uh, figure out how 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 do I how how do I how do I make myself feel better when I feel bad, or how can I turn off my my sad or my mad in order to go become rational again, or to get into my body without negating any of these groups of cells? How do I create a healthy relationship with all four parts of who I am, whatever that part is, see the value in that, and then create uh, interrelationships within myself. Because if I have four very different, unique characters inside of me, and you have four inside of you, that means inside of every relationship, there's eight of us. And there's a lot of characters to get along. So what? how can we look at our relationship and really understand what's healthy between us and when do we become unhealthy? And how can I help you when you're feeling like you need support? And how can you look at me and support me when I need support? So um it, it it you know we humans we are very very diverse and very complex and and yet we still are understandable to a certain level and and it's like you know i'm a true believer that that the tools that you've been using now as far as breath following breath into the present moment and into meditation into the consciousness of the body the somatics you're consciously choosing to shift yourself away from different parts of your brain that you you feel will be advantageous to you to be able to have those tools because they it's you have found a way to find yourself peace or at least to be able to calm that which does not feel peaceful there's, there's a few things I'd love to touch on here. Uh, first of which is these four characters, which is, is something I mentioned briefly in the pre-show intro before we got started here. So just to unpack them a bit more, these four characters are from Jill's book, Whole Brain Living. And I think they're really valuable to get to know. It totally does remind me of internal family systems or parts work. And I know it's in the book, you mentioned that as well. And I was thinking that before you addressed that, but it's, it's really cool because in parts work, I, when I practice IFS or parts work, I don't necessarily do it to the way that Richard Schwartz developed it with uh, firefighters and everything else. I just think of them as different parts. And one of the things that I love about your four characters is it's like fill in the blanks. Like these are the four characters versus like, oh, 
you have a ton of different parts now, like figuring them out, you know, it's, these are the four characters. And so everyone can hear directly from your mouth in a few words, how would you describe each of these characters? So, um, uh, first of all, yes, IFS, I think is a, is a valuable tool. Uh, but most of the different parts that we identify through IFS work end up being what I call character two parts, different parts of character two or hmm. character one, if it's going to be the protectors. So the way I look at the brain is anatomically. And if we look at the brain and we say, okay, we have two, uh, two emotional groups of cells um, and one group of cells is right here, right now, then that emotional group of cells is going to be experiential. What does it feel like for me to exist in this present moment? What do, what is the temperature of the air? What is, what does it feel like to have these glasses on my nose? Um, experiential, what does it feel like to dive into the water and to feel the temperature of the water and the pressure of the water? What does wet feel like? Okay, this is the experience of the present moment without judgment. And that's going to be the right emotional cells. That's what they do. They're experiential. Uh, the left emotional cells have me, the individual. So as soon as I meet the individual, I have an ego, I have little Jill, and I have a past, then this is going to be all the pain from my past. Because all my pain from my past is my pain from my past, right? And so that's where we end up with all these different little exiles and different parts of ourselves that we can identify. You could write a whole book on just this little part of who we are, left emotional tissue. And the thing about both of those um, uh, in the left hemisphere or in the right hemisphere is this is emotional tissue. It is emotional tissue. It can do nothing except be emotional or experiential. That's what, that's what it is. It's like a red filter. You'll, we'll always filter everything red. Well, emotion or experiential will, can never be cognitive or thinking because that's a different kind of organization of information. So what I call character one in the left hemisphere is character one left thinking tissue. And, th and that character is rational. It knows one plus one equals two. There's no emotion in, K in one plus one equals two or A plus B equals C. These are simply the manipulation of data and facts. So the left um, thinking tissue is going to be our, our cognition, our rational organization, our A-type personality. It thinks linearly across time. So it understands a calendar. It understands uh, the 24 hours in a day. It's great at planning. It's great at setting a schedule. It, it does all those things when we go to work. Uh, it creates order inside of my drawers. Um, you know, it, 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 there's a method to it. That's how, it, that's what it does naturally. That's what those cells do. So that I call that character one. Character two is what I call the- real, real quick, um, that's your Hel Helen, Hell on yeah. Wheels, right? My so give it a name. I call mine yeah. Helen, Hell on Wheels. She gets it done. She's busy. I love Helen. Do I want to live my life as Helen? No. Do I want her to be my priority? Mm, no, but I need her desperately to run my schedule, to take care of my life, to, uh, you know, keep order in my world. And I love Helen, but Helen's value structure is all about more and it's got to be more and it's got to be right. And it's got to be all this judgment. And it's like, I don't want to live with all that judgment all the time. I want to have some peace in my heart. I want to be able to love people without judging them all the time and blah, 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 and all that. So anyway, so, so Helen, that's what I call Helen. Character two is the emotion of the left hemisphere. And this is all the emotion, all the pain from my past. 
and all my emotional experience into the future. So it's my fear of the unknown. And it's, it's uh, every time my, my anything negative happened to me in my past. So it's all my emotional trauma. And then I can go into IFS and I can say, okay, well, let's start naming all these little parts of who I am in exiles, because that's where they're living. There's all this stuff inside of that little character too. So I call mine Abby. Abby for me stands for abandonment. Uh, I feel like as soon as I came flying out of my mother's womb, oh my God, that was a trauma. And I'm going to look at that as, as a physiological abandonment, an energetic shift from being a part of her symbiotic, you know, oneness of with my mother to being an individual. So now, is that I, something you remember? Cause we all experience no. that trauma. Oh, okay. So that applies for anyone listening. Yeah. Cause no, I know, I, I know remember. very few people that do remember that uh, no. actually. Yeah. But I'm sure it was not pleasant. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So we can all relate to this. In other yeah. words, the feeling yeah. of we, abandonment. You know, I think scream. that's an important point. We scream yeah. when we're born for a reason, you know, mm -hmm. for all, for two reasons. One is, is, uh, this that we're on, we're on our own right as soon as we're on our own bam we have to breathe as soon as we breathe we're no longer breathing water liquid uh amniotic fluid right we're no longer symbiotic in that environment and now we have this explosion where essentially our lung tissue expands rapidly like a big balloon just gets blown up and now i have to cross that barrier between being a liquid breather to being an oxygen breather an air gaseous breather i mean and it's traumatic i mean it is a physiological trauma but it's natural, right? It's like when we die, that also will be in its own way trauma because things have to shut down and turn off, but it's part of the life death, uh, you know, sequence. But anyway, so, so, but that's all, that's my pain because from that, from that abandonment, all, you know, this is what happens to that group of tissue. It's miraculous. That group of tissue, those cells come into an agreement with the rest of the system and their job is to step out of the present moment experience. I mean, have you ever really stopped to think about, oh my God, I'm not just here. I'm not just a living creature. I'm not just here in the present moment, but I have a group of cells that have purposely figured out how to step out of the present moment and move into every experience I ever experienced in my past to compare that to the present moment experience so I can learn whether or not I want more of that which is in the present or if I wanna push away and say I want less of that. So our capacity to learn as human beings at a neurological cellular level is the price is, is 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 the price that these beautiful cells make and if the present moment is a peaceful blissful euphoric space which i truly believe is that based on the consciousness of the right hemisphere these precious cells were willing to step out of that bliss in order for us to be able to make ourselves safe on an instant by instant basis. So whenever you're feeling your emotional pain and you're thinking, I hate my emotional pain and <laughs> just remember that you can add the storyline to all of that pain, or you can actually recognize that it is because of that, that pain that is a message to push away from because I am a capable of of learning new new material. I mean, it's a beautiful gift, but you know, it's a tough it's a tough call. You know, on all, on all that vein, comes. yeah, I I wanted to ask you, and this seems like a good uh, time to ask you at this point. What is the value and the importance of actually feeling these denser emotions? Because so often people don't want to feel them, and they'll do anything to just say that uh, either numb and dissociate themselves or, and I should say, there's a movement of ne never entertain a negative thought or feeling, which I think is like the worst advice. So I'd love to hear from you what comes up. 
Well, I think pain, whether it's a physical pain or an emotional pain or a spiritual pain, pain is a big flag being waved f saying, hey, there's something going on here that doesn't feel right to my soul. So I need to look at it. And now I can be afraid to look at it because sadness makes me sad. And sadness is overwhelming or consuming. But it is in that sadness that what is it about, what is at the core of this sadness? Because, because it's going to be, uh, you know, we're like a tree with not a whole, all these many roots and yet all these branches. So what is at the root? And can I explore at the level of the root in order to see what is sadness. Where does my sadness come from? So after I give you an, ex an example, um, when I, after I had my stroke, um, I started, I didn't know any emotions. All my emotions, my left hemisphere had wiped out. All my emotions from the past were gone. So I had no, no anger. I had no fear. I had no sadness. I had no deep grief. I had none of that stuff. And the first time that anger started to come back online, um, I live in the woods and uh, these moles that live in the woods uh, were making these mole runs in my yard. And I was actually feeling angry. I was feeling anger, but I didn't know it was anger. And I'd say right. to my mom, I feel horrible. She said, well, describe it to me. And I said, well, well, I, my chest is tight and my my." Uh, my jaw's clamped and I'm, I'm a furrow in my brow and I just want to scream and bite. And I just feel horrible. And she said, Jill, that's anger. And I said, why on earth would anybody ever purposely feel this? Because it feels horrible. But the point there was that by understanding that I had the ability to experience anger. Okay. Anger is a circuit that I can run. And the anger circuit gets triggered so that I can go back and look at that, what is at the core of this experience of running my anger circuit. And it was these moles. And it's like, well, I'm not really mad at the moles. I live where the, I choose to live where the moles live, right? It's not the other way around. And so in doing so, then I, I took the pain and the anger away from the anger and just was angry to realizing, okay, there's a flag being waved here for me to look at something that is stimulating, causing this circuit to run inside of me. And it happened to be these moles. So, so it's, it's pain, whether it's a physiological, physical pain, uh, or an emotional pain or a spiritual pain. Again, it is, th this is information. And if I look at it as information, then it's like, oh, I need to go. There's something here for me to go look at. and Or I can get lost in the anger, but I'm not supposed to get lost in the anger because I have all this other brain that is designed to look at that circuitry and say, okay, rational brain, come in and figure out, is there something at the core of this? And in the meantime, my right hemisphere comes online and says, I love me and got me no matter what it is. But I knew, I will say this, when I had had the stroke and I lost all those deep emotions, one, I had no linearity across time. I could not learn. And two, I didn't have the flags being worn, being waved at me that this is something, this is information that you need to be able to explore in order to learn. And third, my life was, was not half so rich because I didn't have deep emotion. And so the beauty of the design of what we are, if we're willing to look at this as a beautiful design and to savor, you know, I tell my friends all the time, I don't mind if you're miserable, as long as you remember to enjoy it. <laughs> That's because great. You're capable of being miserable. I mean, mm -hmm. who doesn't want to be miserable once in a while? Because there's, there's, and there's depth in that experience. So for all the people, and I know there are many people who, who are all about, oh no, I don't want to feel my emotions. I am so just the opposite. 
but run it for 90 seconds. I mean, it goes right back to uh, the beginning of this conversation. There is nothing more deep and more beautiful than grief. And if someone passes in your life and you don't allow yourself to have to dive in deep, let the pain take you to your knees, take you to your floor, take you to your whale, take you to the explosion of your soul. Why on mm. earth you let yourself do that? I mean, you're, I, you're, you're missing life. That is life. Now, nobody said you, you do it all the time and make it be all the time and let it consume you and let become addicted to these negative emotions, but to not permit yourself the privilege of being fully human, you have to ask yourself, what am I afraid of? Beautiful. I resonate with that so deeply. Now, from a neuro like scientific approach in terms of uh, disassociating or avoiding pain or negative thoughts and feelings, we can say, is there any science that you could speak to that talks about the danger of not allowing yourself to feel these denser and heavier emotions? I think that instead of looking at a neurological level, we ought to look at a mental health of our society level. Perfect. It is not natural. It is no more natural for me to get lost in the depth and pain of my emotions as it is for me to avoid it. Mm. Mm. The thing is about emotions is that this is information. And if my gut is screaming at me, no, don't take that job. When my left hemisphere thinking is saying, well, I'm going to take that job because it's, uh, uh, you know, twice as much money. And, and then I can get on this track faster and then I can get that car and then I can do this and I can do that. When my gut is screaming, you take, if you take our children <laughs> to myself, you take our children out of school you know, little Joey is fragile and little Joey is just now becoming stable. And little Alice, she's got two more years. And of course, she we want her to be with her pack for the next two years. I mean, all, all this, all this unseen unknown, uh, if I don't allow myself to feel my way through life, I'm a feeling creature who thinks. I'm not a thinking creature who feels. Let's go back to that. I'm a feeling creature who thinks. And if I don't feel in my emotions, if I don't feel my life is healthy and I'm not basing my life on the value structure of what is good for my gut and good for my, my bigger picture, then it cannot. It is impossible for it to simply be good for me, the individual and mine, and off we go. And um, based on your history, I'm guessing... Uh, you know exactly what I mean as far as mm -hmm. having a career in in a Silicon Valley world where what is rewarded is not necessarily who you are as an individual, but how can you perform uh, for the bigger picture of that institution, not of you and of your your loves and your world. You'll, you'll appreciate this, Jill, just a quick share. A few weeks ago, I delivered a presentation for my new book, uh, of which the presentation is called Overcoming Overwhelm. The book is Overcome the Overwhelm. And overwhelm is a signal, I like to say, but I think all of us can relate to like overwhelm being an emotion. It's a feeling, right? So it's pretty straightforward. At yeah. the end of this presentation, it was a pro bono thing for some, some um, uh, Silicon Valley type execs. A woman asked me afterwards, it was just like less than 10 people. So it was kind of an intimate setting. She goes, you talked, and she said it like this, you talked a lot about feelings, but see, feelings don't have an IQ. What do you have to oh, say oh, about oh. that? And I was just like, exactly. I was just like, whoa, like not only is that confrontational, but also like, yeah, would you expect with a presentation like this? And it was just so right. like, eye opening to because I already know this I didn't I never worked in corporate but corporate clients corporate friends things like that but just yeah. how disassociated some people are from their their feelings it's it's yeah 
alarming. Yeah. Anyways, I know we and, don't have. And yeah, me, go ahead. And let me say say this to that is because that left hemisphere, that left thinking rational part of her brain, which she was priding herself on. Um, it can be a soft leader where it is supportive and loving and kind and a part of a team, or it can be a hard leader where it is driving everything with the whip. And um, uh, the hard character one, which is what I call that, is actually running from their emotions they're driven by exactly yeah that's their the irony and and emotions i mean it's it's the first round i mean it's like a pipe and if you don't allow the emotions to flow through or you ignore them or you push them down they become like a powder keg at some point that pipe is going to get so full that it will manifest and it might be being ugly with your spouse or your children it might be being ugly with self uh it might be moving into an addiction it might be uh who knows but there's all kinds of negative options for us to choose from in order to run as far as fast from our emotions as we possibly can yeah, thank you for saying that. That's important to highlight. And I'm hoping we can get time to squeeze in one more topic. But before we do, just real quick, could you provide a few of the characteristics for characters three and four? Yeah. So so the we went through character one, rational thinking, left hemisphere, uh, character two, all the pain from my past, because me, I'm me, the individual, I'm in that left hemisphere. And that left hemisphere values me and mine. And that's what that girl, that lady was essentially saying to you. This is about me and mine. And, and I need to be productive and I'm going to, you know, produce in the world. The right hemisphere doesn't have me the individual. When I experienced my stroke, that girl died that day. Those cells went offline. And I simply, I was no longer Jill Bolte Taylor. I look like her. I sound like her. I would, again, think more or less and, and act like her uh, and, and, you know, talk about the brain again, which I didn't think was going to happen, but it did because it came so naturally. Uh, but it's right here, right now. And in the right here, right now, the experience, the emotional character three, more experiential of the present moment. Again, what does it feel like to be in the present moment? What does it feel like when I take this color and I mix it with this color and I, I paint and now I have this new color and there's new possibilities and there's no right and no wrong and no good and no bad. There's no judgment. Instead, there's creativity and there's possibility and there's innovation and there's entrepreneurialism and there's all these possibilities of the creatives that terrify uh, many of the character one uh, left brain thinkers because they're the bean counters, right? They, they don't care about the design. They care about how many of which are you going to sell? And so what are we going to do, right? So, so these are just different parts of our own brain and we all have this. Uh, but differently um, uh, developed. So character three is that experiential of the right hemisphere. And then character four is the thinking tissue in our right hemisphere. What is it doing over there? Well, what is it doing? It's in the present moment. It's big picture. It's not emotional. It's connected to all that is because it's in the left hemisphere where I define the boundaries of where I begin and where I am. It's in the left hemisphere. I define me, the individual Jill Bolte Taylor. Well, if I don't have Jill Bolte Taylor, then I'm big as the universe connected to all that is. And I have this incredible sense of gratitude and awe. And my divine self is going to be where? It's going to be in that space where I'm good with whatever is. Whatever is, is. And aren't, aren't we lucky to be alive? And isn't it lovely that we can quiet what's going on in the left hemisphere, noise making? And when that goes quiet, then we can open ourselves up to the possibility of the unknown without fear and just a beautiful connection. So we end up with these four very different ways of being in the world, and we all have them based on the anatomy of our brain. And then we have, have the power to choose moment by moment who and how we want to be, and we can train ourselves to be able to do that so that we can live a happy, peaceful, creative, productive life.
So this character four, and you know, before I read your book recently to prepare for this interview, I saw your TED talk and and experienced like different uh, parts of your work. But when you spoke about your stroke in, I think it was 1996, mid 90s, and it lasted, uh, it took about eight years, I should say, to recover. How you describe that feeling of your right brain being activated really brought me to that feeling of oneness that I've experienced through plant and earth medicines. And a lot of the listeners of this podcast are familiar and working with this, uh, specifically one called Bufo or 5-MeO-DMT. Have you come across that one? Yep. What? How can you relate a Bufo and what is happening in the experience of, of that specific medicine to what we're talking about? Well, I think that I'm going to clump, I'm going to create, I'm going to clump everything into the psychedelics because right now we are at a era where we are going from a swing from push it all down to explode it out into the world. And I think that we're in a dangerous place and I'll tell you why. The, the, first of all, when we lose perception of individuation, which is what happens, um, and I'm not speaking to these uh, based on personal experience. I'm doing this based on all the people I continue to talk to on a regular basis who are doing these different kinds of molecules and what it feels like um, and what they're gaining from it. Uh, how are they trying to sustain it or integrate the experience? And do they feel the need to go back for more? And I think that there's always that is the key. What is the difference between us creating a new addiction versus us actually using a tool to gain an insight? And once we have the insight, then we don't need the the, the drug anymore. Okay, so so um so my concern is that well, first of all, what's happening is that we're shifting ourselves away with these different molecules into the present moment, away from the circuitry of the left hemisphere essentially character one and character two are disappearing. The universe is exploding. We are gaining a new insight into what am I as a biological creature? Be I a biological creature on a molecule? Any molecule in order to make an impact on our brain has to have receptors already inside of that brain for a molecule to land on in order for me to have an experience. So if I take a psychedelic uh, molecule and I explode myself out of my normal reality, my normal reality is still right over in there in that circuit. But now I'm no longer focused on that. The inhibitions that it might have on this experience are now gone. And so now I'm having this experience and I'm gaining a new insight. Okay, I can value that once. Um, however, here's my, here's my concern is that the brain's response at a physiological cellular level to these molecules is neuroplasticity, which is why you're doing it in the first place, and uh, possibly neurogenesis. Neuroplasticity and neurogenesis is the brain's response to trauma. So what we're doing is we're saying, I'm gonna take a molecule, I'm gonna put it inside of my brain, I'm gonna gain a new perception, and in response, part of my brain's physiological cellular response as a neuroanatomist is neuroplasticity and neurogenesis. Okay, as long as we're really admitting what we're doing here, then I think that needs to be part of the conversation that's kind of being left out right now. Um, so, so that's what's happening. At a cellular level, we're creating a trauma. We're breaking circuitry. We're running new clean circuitry. May be that the right thinking tissue and the receptors that are not often stimulated there, especially by chemistry, because we don't really eat anything natural in our diets that runs that circuitry. And yet we have also skewed ourselves to the value structure of the left hemisphere perhaps partially because we haven't over the last, you know, 5,000 years been consuming, many of us consuming these molecules. 
So um, uh, that's that's what what is happening, and and it's not just at the psychological medicinal level; it's at a cellular traumatic level, and I just think that we need to be aware. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that because personally, I have so many feelings about the movement of psychedelics, plant and earth medicines right now and how it is the Wild West. And I wouldn't say for me, it's so much scientific because I would love to pick your brain and learn more. It's more just... It- it, it, just from the base level of kind of what you alluded to people going back for these peak experiences versus integrating. And that's why I am an integration guide to help people ground because we don't need to chase these peak experiences, but also seeing people part of that. There's like different camps and people that are chasing peak experiences and some are just disassociating, disassociating and not grounded in the human experience. And there's also trauma, different style of trauma from reckless facilitators as well. So there's a massive conversation here that needs to be had. And I know we're at time. And of course, I waited till the end to ask the big and heavy question. But if you uh, just put it out there, if you'd ever want to do a 2.0, I think that would be a great podcast to unpack this specific topic so much more. Yeah. yeah, no, I'm I'm happy to. I, I'm one of the few voices of caution uh, that is coming in, but I'm coming in uh, out of complete respect for um, uh, for the brain, for the brain cells. I recognize the value. Um, and anybody who's saying, oh, you know, if they're on the other side of the wagon and it's like, oh, I'm going to do it, I want to do it, I'm going to do it a lot, but I don't care. Um, uh, it, you know, the best evidence for how how powerful these, these meds are, these molecules are, is if you go to any of the research, go to any of the research, read the research, I read the research, read the research, and look at what they, what the exclusionary and the inclusionary uh, requirements to participate or to be excluded from. And as you go through those lists, uh, whether it's a ketamine, whether it's a psilocybin, whether it's a whatever it is, all this research, um, you know, uh, if you add it up, it's like 80, 85% of the population doesn't qualify because of these extraneous circumstances of vulnerability at the level of the brain. And now we are having to manage uh, individuals who, who you know, my brother's one of these people. He His schizophrenia turned on because of psilocybin. And oh, his wow, brain I got didn't know the memo that. to turn on the hallucinogenic, and but he never got the message to turn it off. So my brother is in constant communication with Christ 24 seven and his life has been destroyed because of his recreational use back in the what seventies of uh, of a hallucinogenic medication. So, which is why I went into the study of the brain in the first place. So, um, so I care deeply about this. And, and I mean, we are at a point in some of our society, especially with ketamine, the people, the things people are doing with ketamine are off the charts terrifying to me. And um, uh, yeah, I could not agree more with ketamine. I'd love to unpack that with your brother. I recently heard, maybe it was in your book, maybe it was a podcast, but I think this is important for the listeners. When you say he's in constant communication with Christ, one of the things that I heard you say was that he was told to go to a public setting. I forget where it was and be naked. And then they gave him a warning. Then he went back the next day. So when he's in constant communication with Christ, I want the listeners to understand what that means. It's his version right. of constant this is communication. Full blown delusion, hallucination, schizophrenia. Right. This man has been uh, diagnosed with chronic schizophrenia for uh, 45 years now. And it is not uh, it is not a healthy, a happy, uh, it's a tragic life. It was a tragic loss of of this young man. So um, 
Uh, yeah. Well, anyway, I'm, I appreciate that you are, are looking at this uh, through the filter of, of all of you. Um, and because, you know, the, the people who are just waving the flags, um, you know, there's, there, it, it's terrifying, uh, what we're about to embark on, uh, what we are embarking on. And yes, there will be some people who are, uh, qualified, but if you, if you sign up, if you, if you, if you have to sign up for like six sessions, can't, why, what, what's the point there to me? Once you have lost your perception of reality and how your brain constructs reality, then you know that the reality that you construct on a regular basis is no more real or better or more defined than what the loss was. So just in knowing that it allows you to take the emotional attachment to the stories away without having to repeatedly Anybody who asks you to repeatedly create trauma inside of your brain for therapy, you've got to ask yourself, uh, really, is that what I really want to do? And, you know, that's what I'm referring to when I say reckless facilitators, because if they're asking you to sign up for multiple sessions, that's a massive red flag. One of the things that I look for in a facilitator, and no one's going, not no one's going to say this, but you can feel it through the energy of their words and their communication. Yeah. But it's like, no, I don't want to see you again, because if I see you again, that means that it's not working. And then exactly. I, it's not about the money. It's about the impact. And I tell, tell people all the time with my my six step breath process. Like, I don't want you to be using the six step breath process because if you do the final word, the H in the breath, which is habits to integrate, it all comes back to integration. Then you right. won't need to come back to the breath process or the brain exactly. huddle or the psychedelic. So, Jill, I know you have to get going, but thank you so much for making the time and spending a little thank bit you. extra time. It's I been a privilege. It. I'm glad this worked out, Sam. Thanks so much.